With SOX on the horizon and fast approaching, I was surfing the web. Do, do people still say that? Like surfing the web, is that still a thing people say? I do. I was looking for just some saw content to get those saw juices flowing. <laughs> not those juices. And in doing this, I stumbled across an iceberg video. It was a pretty damn good video. It covered so many topics, a lot of work clearly went into it, and I'll put a link to it down below. And it was when I was watching Blagus's video, I learned that there is a Saw styled movie that was also put out by Lionsgate. Now I know the first thing you're asking is, Gub, a Saw styled movie by Lionsgate. Is it a prequel? Is it a sequel? Where does it fit into the narrative? And to that, first off, get out of here, this isn't a Q&A session. And secondly, no, it is not a prequel, it is not a sequel, it is not in the universe. Lionsgate just made a same style movie and distributed it. We don't get Jigsaw and his lovely face and his husky voice here, unfortunately. Oh no, it's changed now. Now it was distributed by Lionsgate, but I think that's as much as they put into it. You know, it didn't have the same director, writer, or even like the blood guy. It was just distributed by them in certain regions. But even still, it's a bit weird that they done that. And even weirder, this was done during like the height of Saul. So somebody was banking in on Saul and Lionsgate still helped them put it out. Straight to DVD, of course, but they still helped. That aside, I tracked down this movie, watched it. Now let's just pick it apart. I mean, really, how bad can a straight-to-DVD Saw-style movie, also done by Lionsgate, really be? Let's find out. We open on a young gal here with what looks like a strobe collar on. I don't quite know. But listen to the music. Now, this is like the very opening here. Listen to the music playing. Is anyone there? Is, is this part of the game? It's like the opening to a trailer. Now look, I'm not some music man. I can't just hear that and be like, that's a C key or that's a G spot or anything like that. Now it might just be me, but that certain key just seems to have that trailer vibe. You know, where it's opening very slowly and building to something to really hook you. This is kind of weird, you know? Unfortunately, it doesn't work the same here. Now she is asking if this is part of the game. So she's not too against it. Like she knows it's part of a game, but I don't think she knows what type of game it's going to be. We get that signature voice setting out the rules. Welcome, Tara. Hello? Are you ready to play for the chance to win a- Well, I say signature, more like one of those doctor signatures that you can't fucking read. It's there, but it isn't what it should be. He doesn't sound like a killer, does he? He sounds like somebody that you would see in a sci-fi show where one spacecraft makes contact with another spacecraft and they just get a message through. Captain! There are two buttons in the next room, red and green. It's your task to push both. Now, I don't quite understand her collar. I mean, it's stroby and it looks nice. You know, she's ready for a rave in Glastonbury. However, when he sets it off, we hear that very default and cliche electricity noise flowing through it, but then she bleeds. Or pay the price. The price? <laughs> so is it electrocuting her or like cutting her in some way? We don't fucking know, it just hurts. And for the record, she is too clean. Like, look at her here. She is flawlessly clean for a Saw-styled movie. Like, she is in a dank dungeon. She should be a little bit grubby, at the very least. Me, personally, I like my women like I like my Saw victims. A little bit dirty and a collar wouldn't go amiss. She is tasked with pressing two buttons in the next room, and this will open up a briefcase to her modelling contract. I can't help but feel the stakes are slightly lowered in this movie. I don't know fully what's going on here. We're one minute in, and I've already pointed out quite a few things, which I think are fair. It's going to be a long one. Get a drink, kick your feet up, just sit back and enjoy. Now, the first button is across some broken glass, and she doesn't hesitate. She goes straight across the glass. Thankfully, they do show her not wearing shoes. So, so far, it's got one up on Saw. What are those? The voice is ticking down the timer and even asks her, are you scared? So we get the gist that this isn't a pre-recording. He is talking to them live. 10 seconds. Are you scared? Fuck you! She goes dunking for that second button and she comes out looking, yeah, a little bit fucked. Like she's not... That modeling contract's a bit useless now, isn't it? Cut to the most relaxing credits you could imagine in a movie like this.
Like, the visuals are clearly trying to do something very scary, but the sound just does not blend with it whatsoever. <laughs> It's like the American Horror Story intro just had an edible and just cannot be fucked. <laughs> Cut to the factory and we see the police rolling up during the day, I think. I don't know. I can't tell by that skyline. It could be any fucking time of day, let's be real. We find the poor model here and she's looking a little bit worse for wear and the police are a bit of a dick. Beginning to be the boy that cried wolf, detective. Yeah, well, maybe if you'd gotten here a little sooner. Just a little bit. Like, there was no need for that. But what we get from this whole scene is that Detective Bowman is our main man and a criminal profiler has been assigned to assist him. This is a crime scene. I'm going to have to ask you Special to Special Agent out. Christine Robeson. I assume you got the paperwork? Now, at first, he doesn't fucking want her. However, they come to love each other. Yeah, they said they were going to send a head shrinker briefly in the few scenes we get with them. He just accepts her pretty fast. But it is in this that we learn the games have begun again. You know the way that Saw just seem to have games at certain moments, you know? Like they're trapping certain people as individuals or as part of a group. It kind of just popped up here and there. It almost feels like this is a regular thing in this universe. Cut to some guy looking like he's about to just clock in for a shift at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, and then we see some guy waking up blindfolded. This is Brandon, here's our skater boy of the movie, and we're going to come to love Brandon. He's a good egg. Now Brandon gets the blindfold off, wakes up, and finds a girl in a similar situation, Kelly. And again, these people are fucking spotless. Look at them. They should be at least a little bit dirty. These two don't have a fucking clue what's going on. You know, Kelly thinks that Brandon put them here, which is very fair. But eventually she comes to and they set off together to just try and understand how the fuck they got here and why. And this is where we come across Jason. He's locked in a cage and he immediately is very hostile towards them. Which, fair enough, he's in a cage. Why the fuck am I here? Why did you bring me here, man? Well, take it easy, man. We didn't bring you here. Hey, calm down, all right? We're just trying to figure all this out right now. But when they get out of the cage, like, there's no urgency to it. Like, he was just kicking off through a fence. They open the cage. They walk out like they've just slept in late for school. Somebody jammed the handle. Thanks, man. Sure thing. You know the way a dog will get raging behind a fence, but you open the gate and suddenly it does not want to fight the other dog? Yeah, that's Jason here. What the fuck am I here? Thanks, man. Sure thing. We then come across Dylan and Cherie, and Jason, yeah, as you'd expect, he immediately starts on Dylan. She little handiwork, son? Huh? Huh? Turns out the man's been stabbed, the man's injured. He puts the blame on Dylan for fucking reasons I don't know. For how untrusting he is towards Dylan, he was far too trusting immediately for Brandon and Kelly. It's weird. Jason picks and chooses. And then finally we come across the sixth and final member of the group, Laura. She's just kind of on her own somewhere in the factory, but they get her, they bring her up to her feet and they clue her in that they're all pretty fucked. We see that they're all tracked somehow. Not sure, nothing is ever mentioned of it, we just keep seeing it on the screens, but there's not like they've got the same wristband or collar and not the same injury where he might have put it internally. They're just tracked. Now that they are all awake, the killer introduces them to Are You Scared? And the guys seem buzzing by this, like they're keen to be on Are You Scared? Welcome to Are You Scared? The reality show? It turns out this is like a reality show in the universe that they all apply to. That just opens up so many questions. Because you can look at it from one of two ways. Either it is a real reality show called Are You Scared that these people all apply to, in which case either the killer managed to somehow hijack their audition tapes or set up a fake email that they all applied to by accident. Option one, I'm not saying it's bulletproof. Or option two, there is no real reality show. It is all just him killing people that he puts out online because he's filming everything and people don't realise it's fake. In which case, surely every contestant fucking ever not returning home would raise a couple of red flags. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's big enough a show that people are applying to it. So not only did we learn that this is a regular occurrence, it's fucking popular. Anyway, that being said, that's one or two theories. Where do you stand on it? Because trust me, we don't get an answer. All we know is that each of these six contestants are going to face their worst fear individually. Now, out of this group of six sprightly young'uns looking for that big payday from the reality show they think they're on, who do you think is going to be first up to die? Now look, I'm not giving in to any cliche stereotypes in horror movies about which one is going to die first. It's Jason. Jason died. Jason goes first. He gets called up, like, immediately. Let the games begin. Jason, 
please join. Yeah, let's rock this mother. He is so hyped to be in this room, and then they play back to him his own audition tape, and he just gets hyped even more. Oh, uh, this is a delay, right? Cause, cause, cause I just said fuck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do like this angle because we get to learn what their fear is before they go into the room and he is scared of waiting in hospitals. Not the surgery itself that he's afraid of, but the waiting for it he says he's scared of. So, I mean, do with that what you will. Make a trap around it. Jason has to face off against a bomb and he's got 60 seconds to do it and he's told that he needs to find the key to be able to stop the bomb. Now, he's the only one that we've seen injured at the start of the movie. Where do you think the key might be, given that he's got all of these surgical implements? It's inside him. I'm just going to let you know now, it's fucking right inside him. It feels like this trap was copied, kind of, from the guy that had to cut his own eye out and saw, only that was done pretty much a little bit better, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> However, here... They've just went for the angle, somebody needs to cut themselves, and fuck it, there's a bomb in the room. Now look, Jason, unfortunately, does not make it. At least I don't think he makes it. I could be wrong, but if we watch it back, he might be alive? <laughs> no, he's fucked. He's fucking obliterated. Now cut back to the cops, and we see that they know the six contestants that are up here. How they managed to get them all so fast... I don't know, because it's all missing person reports. But that was fucking quick for them to just identify the six individuals only. Lady Profiler is of the understanding that the killers try to teach them all a lesson. So it's kind of like Jigsaw, but it's not quite. He doesn't have that same philosophy that Jigsaw did. Now, from that glass box that the model put her face into, they find a ship number on the corner. And let's see just how far that ship number can take them in their clues. It's pretty far, to be honest with you. Like, that fucking number is like the key to everything. Cut back to the Fab Five here, and they don't want to play until Jason's back, because they don't know he's dead. The people get taken away to like their own rooms to go and play, so they don't know the outcome. So the gang are coming to an agreement, they don't want to go further with the games until Jason's back, and they kind of know what's going on a bit more. However, Dylan and Cherie, the creepy twins, nah, they're having none of it. They're here for the big prize, they just fucking want to play. We get a better look at the killer, and he's like Freddy Krueger, like he's just Fuck. And is it just me, or does Dylan not have, like, the creepiest eyes? Like, he should be the fucking villain here. He's staring right through my soul. I promise you, right now, I will take care of you. Nothing is gonna happen. Let's go. So the creepy twins watched their audition tape back. They'd done it as a duo. And we learned that Dylan is a badass and not afraid of fucking anything. I never said you wouldn't take the fall. Because of course he's not. With that stare, nobody's fucking coming near him. And Cherie's afraid of losing Dylan. It's a sweet moment. It's quite nice. He continues to be a dick about it though. Like, he has that twin energy, like he's just waiting to find his sister stuck in certain places if you catch my drift. So they go into their test room, they need to strap themselves into chairs, and then there's conveyor belts with drills coming right at their forehead, and they each have a switch to like stop and start the drill. So it's kind of a game of its self-sacrifice. Maybe Dylan will finally get to drill Cherie. <laughs> He doesn't. He, he doesn't. He's he's not doing well in this game whatsoever. Dylan's a bit of a dick. Like, we already knew that. But in this game, he really is a dick. Like, he's shouting at Cherie to drop the remote and he's going to live. Whereas Cherie is clearly struggling internally with this battle where she doesn't want to die and also doesn't want to lose him. <laughs> I'll be honest, out of this whole movie, Cherie in this scene and the aftermath of it is probably the best acting you're going to see. Now, in any Saw movie, they've got that very unique stylized choice that they make whenever there's a trap going on, the time's ticking down. You know, it's a lot of fast cuts. It makes it very energetic. It makes you feel the anxiety that the person in the trap's feeling. That's kind of what they're going for. <laughs> Here, what approach do they take? Very slow, very sombre drills with the music to match the slow movements. takes away from the intensity just a little bit. And it doesn't help that the drills aren't moving in one continuous path. Like, because it must be over multiple takes, the drills have moved kind of back and forth, 
it doesn't add to it. Now, after all of Dylan's screaming, Cherie does drop the remote, but he's still the one that dies. I don't know what happened there. Like, did the killer oversee this and think he was that much of a dick that he was the one to die? I don't know, and it's never explained, but you'd think that if she dropped it, which she does, you see her do it, she's going to be the one that dies. Next, we get an establishing shot of the factory, and fucking, I lost my mind at this moment. Please tell me you recognise this. There's a place for me, it's the place I go, where the beer is cheap and the lights are low, it's bad as fuck. It's fucking Paddy's Pub. Does that make this guy Cricket? Like, hear me out, I've got a theory. After all we Sonny wraps up, Cricket, through all of the shit we've seen happen to him, loses the fucking plot and goes into killing. Like, we know the man's athletic, he's got like turbo legs, he can do some shit. You've even got Dennis with the security equipment, he could help him get set up. And we've got Mac, like, he could definitely make traps. Like, you tell me he's not an engineer. Clearly, Frank financed the whole operation. I don't quite know where Charlie and Dee fit into the equation, but that's the theory I'm going with. So, the killer's cricket from now on. So the detectives are on the case looking into this glass panel to find out where it came from. Using that shipping code, they not only find out where it was shipped to, but they find out that this guy was taking custom orders for like traps and various bits of equipment to be made. I.e. the very specific box that was glass with a button in the middle. He fucking built. They are already miles ahead, like I thought this was going to take them to a warehouse or a factory. No no, takes them right to the person making the fucking game. I mean, he's unwitting to it, you know, he's just a guy with a job who makes things. That's all he is. It's still weird though, more so because the detectives ask fuck all. They ask if there's any other orders from this person and they get a slip of another order, but really, that's all they fucking get. Like, he lets slip to them that he also made some drill contraption. The one we just seen on poor Dylan Boy. So the detectives realise that they don't have a name for this person, but they get given a previous slip which has an address on it, so they are moving forward like a lot faster than you thought they would. Now the Fantastic Four are trying to escape, and I love when movies fucking do this. Like I love it, but really I hate it, where the camera we're watching as an audience is then on a TV screen, because there's no fucking way that a security camera was at that angle. Now Brandon and Laura, whilst they're looking around, they get given the option to leave. You know, a door opens up and either of them can go through. Now they huff and haw back and forth a little bit about who's going to go, and Brandon steps up to the plate and steps on through. His freedom is here, but uh oh, it's a trap. We're trapped. When the door slams shut, Laura tries to open it, but the door's electric. It's weird because this happened previously and did they forget to add the effect in? Like it's not a great effect, but at least add it in. So we learned earlier in the movie that Brandon is afraid of the dark, so this room is tailored to him, like his audition tape plays and everything. He was the one to take the room. How the fuck was it open to him and Laura? Like up till now, between the creepy twins and Jason, they were told to go on their own, like the trap was ready for them individually. Whereas now, it was a free for all, but it just so happens that he went through. I don't imagine he can change it on a dime. He's told that he's got 60 seconds, it's always fucking 60 seconds in here. In 60 seconds or less, you have one minute. The fire exit downstairs will be open for one minute. But he's got 60 seconds to get towards the exit the other side of the room. He fumbles around a bit, he falls down the stairs, we get a Wilhelm. He hits the lights, and to be honest with you, it is a really fucking cool reveal here. Because he's got the option to put the lights on, however they overbear him, so you can see the room briefly, but of course lights like that are going to fuck with your eyes and make it even harder to see. I'm not going to lie, good idea. Good idea there, and a good reveal when we see all the shotguns pointing at him, and there's trip wires everywhere. I unironically enjoyed that reveal, because we see all the shotguns pointing at him and the trip wires around the room. It's clever. It's good. I'll give you that, are you scared? Now there's trip wires everywhere, he struggles to see and there's a door at the other end of the room. How does he approach the situation? Does he just get down and crawl beneath everything in front of him? Of course he fucking doesn't. He accidentally hits a trip wire and gets shot by every one of the shotguns. It is a hugely dramatic death in the movie, granted. However, it doesn't really work too well as a trap when you can really only die from one specific position. Like, 
If he just went under the trip wires, he would have been safe. If all the shotguns were facing in any other direction, he might not have been shot. But no, no, he stood in the middle of them, hit a trip wire, and got blasted from every fucking side. So I'm sorry to say it, Brandon is more than gone. The herd is truly thinning out at this point. Cut back to the detectives. They've used that slip, they've went to Cricket's house, and the door's locked. There's a nosy neighbour and she kind of just gets told nicely to fuck off, there's nothing here. Now criminal psychologist, cop lady, she says they do not have a warrant and they can't progress at this point but Bowman isn't fucking waiting around. He boots down the door and it would get some information. We see newspaper clippings everywhere of a fire. Can only guess Cricket was involved in that fire somehow. And then they wander into the room and they find all the equipment and all the engineering kind of prototypes. But then they hit out with this. Jesus Christ. Not quite. Now is it just me or can you only really say that response when some body appears and catches you off guard? Not a thing. You can't say that, oh it's not quite Jesus Christ, it's a fucking toolbox. That doesn't work. It works for people, not things. Is that just me? Am I overthinking it? I think I might have got too critical in this movie, but it just seemed weird. One of our girls gets dragged away while the other two freshen up. I mean I don't know why they're freshen up. They could not be any cleaner. But they're freshening up nonetheless. But these two decide to take matters into their own hands. They fight back because they realise there's cameras everywhere, which they've kind of known, but now they realise someone's fucking with them and they just start taking down all the cameras. And I'll be honest, Cricket is not a fan of this. What does Cricket do? He takes a break from Freddy Fazbear's pizza and he goes on the march and I swear his burn changes side here at this moment. Like, just for a second. Cherie is on her own at this point. She's been taking down cameras left, right and centre. She's got a pipe and she hears the elevator coming with something banging about inside it and she is ready for fucking anything. What does she do? She absolutely skewers Brandon. Yes, Brandon lived to tell the tale. Briefly. And he didn't really tell a tale. He lived up to this point and now he's really fucked. Somehow he survived. I don't know. His body doesn't look like it's been blasted with shotguns at point blank range. Like multiple of them. Do you know what he looks like? Do you remember Alone in the Dark? Like the remake that came out that was... I enjoyed it but I appreciate it was shit. You know when you would get injured and it just looked like you were burnt or injured on top of your clothing? Brandon. But when he gets impaled and he kind of lives, is that not like inspiration for that trap in Saw 4 I want to say? You know when the couple were back to back and there were skewers going through both of them and she had to remove them from her and it would kill her man behind her. It feels like there's some inspirations here either from Saw movies that have already been out or a couple of ideas for the Saw movies to come. It's kind of weird when you've watched all the Saw then watch this. Laura is next up. She is not in a good place and she's watching her audition tape. It turns out, can you guess what her fear is? Be spiders, clowns, saws, murderers, germs. She's afraid of germs. For every thing in the world, there's a fear for that thing. Do you know what I mean? And you went with germs. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but if you're making a saw-like movie, fucking up the game a little bit. Now it's never really explained, but what it looks like to me is that while she was dragged away, her own intestines have been cut out and used to wrap around her arms, or she's holding them. One of the two. And then she goes into what I can only describe as like a back alley pet shop. Now in this room we find there's a phone in one box, there's rats in the other, and I think she has to feed her intestines to the rats. Like I'm not sure, it's hard to tell. Feed those delicate little fingers call the police. But Cricket tells her she can lose six pints of blood without dying. There are 12 pints of blood in the human body. You can lose six without consequence. After Again, Saw 5, that was a trap. They had to lose their blood and survive. You know, they could all work together and none of them would die sort of scenario. I don't know if Saul watched this, but it feels like they've taken a few ideas from Are You Scared, which is probably the only thing Are You Scared can be proud of. Now, Kelly is in the control room. She followed those camera cables all the way back to Cricket's HQ and she is watching Laura just have a bit of a lie down by the looks of it. I can't tell if it's meant to be fainting, a dramatic death or not, but... She looks sleepy. Cherie though is on her way. Cherie is there to help her. She is marching down, banging at the door and she is coming in to save the day. But Cricket comes in and sneak attacks her. The colour correction goes a bit fucky here and then Cherie, fair warning to you now, she loses her head in probably the most gruesome, detailed depictions I've ever seen of someone losing their head. I'm obviously fucking with you, look at it. Like I don't know who signed off on everything in this movie. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. Trust me. Kelly is trying to escape the control room, but Cricket is on the other side and he is pissed, so she does not know what the fuck to do. We cut to outside and we see the detectives. They have rolled up, but they need to wait for SWAT. So our man Bowman is torn. Does he just go in now, on his own, for fucking some reason? Like, he knows the games are taking place, 
but he doesn't know the specific urgency of the games or what to expect. Bowman isn't waiting around. He decides to go in, but not before checking the elevator's clear. I, I, I mean, you can see it from your car. It's empty. It's clearly fucking empty. He jumps in the elevator and he finds Kelly, but uh, uh oh, what happens now, do you think? Take a guess at what happens now. Like, just pause it for a minute. Take a guess and we'll see if you're right. The elevator opens from the other side. Cricket appears with an axe. Bowman does not turn around to really see what's going on or act. And Cricket takes his head in half. Like, just halves the fucking thing. Gone. There. Done. What happened to your skills, detective? Like, you were all over it a minute ago. Now look at you. I've got half a mind to be mad at you. Cricket then invites Kelly to one last game. And I don't mean like over the tannoy. He kind of like actually invites her to one last game. She gets into the room and shock horror, it's her fucking mum tied down to the bed. Not like that. It's not weird. Don't worry. We see Kelly's audition tape now. And the difference here is she just tells us that she's afraid every day, but not of what. But then she reveals that she has a secret she hopes no one's going to find out about. Why you would then say that in your audition tape, I fucking have no idea. But she says it. So now we know. She has a secret. Cricket then comes over a live feed. Well, I think it's a live feed. Like, he's replying to her, but it's very much like a recorded video, so I don't fucking know. Kelly's mom then makes this noise. <laughs> and then we get the twist of the movie. Cricket is Kelly's dad. We've heard through Kelly that her dad was an arsehole and abusive. Turns out, they tried to kill him. He just survived it, and this is his revenge tale. Kelly refuses the game, though, and just takes down the camera, and then we get a DVD video screen, so I don't know why a DVD video screen would pop up here. It does, but either way, he can't see what's happening in the room. Cricket is pissed. Cue the intense action movie. No! Play the fucking game! Briefly, that's all you get. Like, I didn't edit that. That's literally the action movie music that we got for a moment. It's very short. Woman Detective is closing in on the rooftops, whereas Cricket is closing in on the two in the room, but he's in no rush about it. He seems more miffed about things than mad. You know, he's not that annoyed about it, like, he could let it go. The gals then trick him with a projector feed, which, I'm, again, not gonna lie, I'll give you a credit there for that one, are you scared? That was a cool little moment. It was that kind of effect you see when people get lost in halls of mirrors and they see like reflections they shoot at, then the glass shatters. I liked it. Fair play. Good on you. Kelly gets the jump on them, then Kelly and their mum just dip hard. And then we get that massively iconic saw moment. You know when they slide the big metal door over and say something really cool? Yeah, she does that as Cricket very realistically burns. Like, I don't know what to tell you, the effects here are Fucking incredible. Cut back to Lady Cop, who we see is in the building, but she doesn't actually uncover fucking anything in this moment. Like, we then just jump to her outside, wheeling bodies. Why it showed her on the rooftops doing this chase thing, like, I don't know. It was like it was leading up to some big confrontation. Then they cut it, and then they just left her in to wander about the factory. We get another exterior shot, and this one here is 100% sitcom -y. Now, it pissed me off for a moment. I couldn't quite place it. I thought it was the apartments there in Friends, but it isn't. Turns out, this is the J Street Apartments from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's where I knew them from. It's minor. It doesn't matter to this movie. I just thought that was pretty fun. We see Kelly back at home in the living room. It's quite clear they're packing up, ready to fucking leave, because of course you would. She's watching the TV and it turns out there was only six bodies uncovered at the scene. But Gub, there should be seven bodies at the scene, I hear you ask. Yes, there fucking should be. Cut over to Woman Detective and she is talking to just a force ghost at this point and he tells her that the body was not in this room. Now we jump back over to Kelly. She's watching the TV. The feed starts going all fucky and there's a live feed now playing through her TV. She is watching herself on the TV as Cricket arrives behind her. She screams, Cut to credits for a very slow piano music as well. Like, they just they just taper you out in this movie. <laughs> nice and calm. Like, you just had all that killing, and yeah, they don't know how to balance atmosphere or tone whatsoever. That was Are You Scared? I'm not sure if you'd heard of this movie. I certainly hadn't until the other day. Fuck me, it was a wild ride of absolute horseshit but then glimmers, and I mean very vague glimmers, like you have to squint and it needs to be like pitch black and the shine is really far away, 
but there's glimmers of hope and cool ideas in there. It wasn't good though. I just think it was really fucking weird that Lionsgate also helped distribute this. Like they had a helping hand on people seeing this movie when they already made Saw 1 and 2 at this point. Like Saw was at its peak and then this came out. It, it just, it seems, seems odd. I genuinely enjoyed watching it knowing that I was going to make this video. Like it wasn't a good movie by any means, but I enjoyed how shit it was because it kept surprising me. And this was a lot of fun to fucking talk about. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate you watching. And whilst you're still here, just hanging about, like, don't go anywhere just yet, but I'm going to kick you out soon. Hit like, subscribe, all those amazing, cool, free things. They really help push the channel out and it makes my day. And anyway, with all that being covered, thank you so much for watching.